Hello, and welcome to Meme Gen Monday here on Answer Everywhere. Today, we're jumping into the Kubernetes source code. I think probably most of you know what Kubernetes is or have at least heard of it. It's a container management or cluster management system from the uh, folks at Google. And it's, uh, you know, it's everywhere. So um, let's take a look at what's going on in the code. But before that, um, I'll give a little quick overview for um, to maybe explain about how I think about Kubernetes, which is probably also how you think of Kubernetes, but but maybe not necessarily. And I got some sort of weird notification here. So let me make sure that I'm actually live. Okay, cool. All right, so um, if you go on Wikipedia, for example, the first sentence says that it's an open source container orchestration system. But um, also down here, it says the type is cluster management software. Now these are related concepts. I tend to think of Kubernetes more as a cluster management system than a container orchestration system. How are they different? Well, for if you're talking about containers and orchestration, it seems like the unit, uh, the main unit of analysis for understanding Kubernetes would be the container, kind of starting at um, containerized microservices and thinking of Kubernetes as a way of kind of shipping them around different places. But if you're talking about cluster management, then the unit that you're discussing is really the computer cluster. And then containers are, are there, but they're more of an implementation, implementation detail rather than a, a, perhaps a first class citizen. And so that's the way that I think of Kubernetes. Um, and I think that's probably um, historically closer to being accurate. So initially we had, um, initially at Google, there was the Borg cluster management system. And then at some point, um, the, uh, at some point we got C groups. Let's see if we can find C groups. Well, first of all, let's open Borg. You don't get a lot of stuff there. But C groups, um, it says, uh, engineers at Google started working on this feature in 2006 under the name Process Containers. And then in late 2007, the nomenclature changed to control groups. And then um, it, th this functionality kind of flowed outside of Google into the, into the Linux kernel and people like Docker or whatever started creating systems around configuring C groups. Um, so I'm not sure really which one came first. It might be that, that the C groups came first internally at Google. It might be that Borg came first. But um, the Borg is kind of a, a general purpose sort of system that you can understand without really knowing anything about Docker or containers. So they have this paper. Um, this is sort of what's known um, publicly about, about Borg. Actually, let me keep this chat out of the way. Um, I think it's from like 2015-ish, 2015. Um, and it's got a diagram of how things work. And maybe before we look at the diagram, let's look uh, just so we have a, a picture in our mind at sort of what was going on at Google at the time. So I think this picture is at least supposedly, whoa now, can I maximize this? Hmm. Let's try. Does this help? No. All right. Well, we'll have to deal with, uh, I think we'll have to deal with an unscaled image. Um, but it's a bunch of computers on, on a table, um, different systems. And uh, my understanding is that this was essentially whatever the, uh, like Larry and Sergey found in the Stanford garbage, uh, garbage area. It's just kind of some cluster of heterogeneous computers that didn't have a lot to do with each other. We also have some images of the early, um, some of the early Google racks, as I thought we did. This one's a bit close up. Let me try image search. So stuff like this, um, you have, these are essentially um, motherboards that are, that seem to be supporting the weight of a bunch of stuff. 
including presumably the the CPU. These look like disk drives and some sort of PCI card probably or whatever PCI was in those days. And then these all just go into some into some rack and then on top of the rack is some sort of telecommunications switch um, that helps you address all of the machines in the rack. And so to, to talk to a you know, machine, whatever, one, two, uh, let's index it zero, zero, one, two, three, four, or whatever, we would first go to this, somehow get packets to this uh, switch, presumably. Assuming that is a switch, maybe this thing down here is the switch. And then we would, you know, somehow the switch would know to route stuff to that to that machine. So that's that's the sort of picture um, that we have in mind. And uh, with that in mind, if we look at this this Borg PDF, or, or rather, let, let's keep this open. And so, how would you build? How would you if, suppose you had not only this rack but a bunch of them, and you would take all of these clusters and, and you would build some sort of data center out of them, and then you might have multiple data centers in different parts of the world or so forth. But if you uh, but if you want to manage software on them, how does it work? Well, one thing you could do, and you, uh, at some point they might have done that, is you can just have some like Excel spreadsheet of all the computers and their IP addresses and just SSH into the appropriate machine and add software or whatever, update the binary. And maybe you would have some script, like an Ansible style script that will that will automate this for you. But eventually what they did is they built a system where um, all of these where, you know, select one of these machines, let's say like the first one or the first two, and these are going to kind of be in charge of scheduling um, uh, some this cluster. I'll think of this rack as a cluster, but in reality, a, rack, a cluster should be several racks. Um, and then the rest of them, and then it's their job to schedule stuff. So you only really need to talk to these two. And then the rest of the machines um, are get their work information from these two machines. So you address... These two, they they are there are two of them, I guess, for um, for redundancy, and so they need to do some. They need to achieve some sort of consensus. So they need to either speak like Paxos or Raft to each other and decide which one is the leader at any given moment. And then if one fails to be the leader, it'll there will be some sort of failover. Um, and they'll have to have some sort of data database, data structure to um, as they schedule jobs, they'll have to agree on what the what their vision of the database is. So you could imagine something like um, like the Chubby Lock System or Apache Zookeeper will give you basic consensus information, and then you might have something like a distributed key value store to stuff in all of the job control information. And they might use, I have no idea what they used for Borg, but maybe something like Bigtable or some precursor to Bigtable originally. And then all of these other computers, they need some binary, some program or process running on them that like lets them listen to requests from these two um, coordinating servers or master servers um, and accepts jobs from them. And that in, in Borg, this would be called the Borglet. It's just a little let, meaning like mini, mini sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the Borg masters would communicate to the Borglet and they would all schedule all their stuff. And so you can see this kind of in this, um, in this paper. We have a Borg masters. These are the yellow ones. There's whatever, one, two, three, four, five-ish. Um, and then, uh, they communicate to the Borglets on the machines and these machines we can imagine either are, uh, they're, they're displayed as arrays. So we can think of them either as like a rack, different racks of machines or different collections of racks. Um, and, uh, and here it says we have the persistent store is Paxos. So Paxos is an, an algorithm for achieving consensus. I don't know if it's actually a store of data, but, um, I think more modern use cases might, might use raft. Um, but that's that's the basic structure. And you can look at this paper and it'll tell you in 2015 terms um, how everything worked. There's this thing called Alex. A Borg Alex is a reserved set of resources on a machine, which one or more tasks can be run. The resources remain assigned whether or not they are used. So you have some allocation. And the, the Google engineers at the time, they didn't really, you know, and today they... They, they don't really deal with Borg directly. Some other team deals with Borg and make sure make sure that this um, essentially virtual cluster um, uh, where that is being managed by Borg is kind of always running. And then the the users or consumers of Borg are the Google teams and they're scheduling things like their Gmail job or whatever. And you know even uh, back in the day, um, back in the Stanford, let's see if we can find this um, a better version of the Google Stanford.
So even when they had stuff like this, um, they, uh, wait, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, um, they had some way of, oh yeah, okay. So even when they had something like this, they had to do web indexing, right? That was the very first thing they did. And so web indexing is not a serving job. It's a, it's a batch job. So there's some combination of things like batch jobs that you might re think of as normally running on kind of like a, um, a science, maybe like a scientific computing, uh, like sta uh, standard, um, uh, high performance computing cluster. Um, and then there are other jobs that are serving jobs that are doing things like serving web traffic. And so, um, Borg has to kind of manage both of these. And so all of these design principles show up again in, in Kubernetes. And basically you can think of Kubernetes as all the stuff in Borg, but Borg is deeply tied to the Google infrastructure. So it's kind of a re-implementation from scratch, probably getting rid of a lot of the cruft that Borg had accumulated over the years that, that doesn't really need to be there. You know, you don't have to do backwards compatibility. So you use that as an opportunity to get rid of stuff that's not really needed. You can start, and then you start with something smaller that does the whatever the minimal viable Borg stuff is, and you take lessons learned from perhaps other systems that that were built at Google, and so that's that's how you know that's how I think of Kubernetes. And and talking about this, we didn't really talk at all about containers, or sidecars, or any of that stuff. And that's because at least from the perspective that I'm going to take um, in this walkthrough, those are kind of all implementation details to just thinking about how do we make like a virtual cluster where we can schedule things, jobs, um, and, and, and have them run appropriately. And I'm, I'm seeing some, some stuff in the chat. So Jamal and never know. Hello. Hello to both of you. So it, sound, it seems like it's, it sounds like it's evening in wherever never know is, um, it's morning here. So good evening or good morning or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, all right. So that's, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's how I think about, um, how I think about Kubernetes and maybe just to give us a sense of where we are in the history, let's see, um, when Kubernetes came out, uh, compared to like when that Borg paper was <laughs> and it's released 2014 years ago, uh, so initially released 2014. So it seems like, um, is that someone who was open sourced? It was announced by Google in mid 2014. So it sounds like maybe the Borg paper came out as a, re as a response to, or as part of maybe the marketing for, um, for, for describing Kubernetes and, you know, Google has a bunch of these classic papers where they will write out, they'll, they'll write some paper about what they did internally. And that will like spawn a whole, typically like an Apache project to bring, to bring similar distributed computing stuff to the outside world. <laughs> Hi, Dimitri. Good morning to you as well. So here's, um, I have the Kubernetes, uh, GitHub open. I do now have um, uh, um, the Go LSP server installed, so we um, we can poke around in Emacs a little bit. Um, but I couldn't find a great solution so far to having Emacs open a bunch of uh, files in a queue that I could process through the queue the way that I do on the browser. So I'll have to figure out a system for that before we switch over um, to Emacs altogether. All right, so here's the the GitHub. It's uh, Kubernetes is of course written in Go, which is, you know, a readable language. I think there's not much really we need to say about it. Um, oh, okay. There, there is maybe one more thing I want to say, which is that let's see if we can pull up a picture of the Kubernetes architecture. Hmm. This is pretty good. Maybe, um, let's see if there's a picture on, um, on their website. Something like this. Okay. So, um, so here's their, their, their picture of their di of their architecture. I'm going to move chat off just for a second. Um, so whatever this is with cloud, we'll ignore this. Um, so etcd 
is this distributed database. So I don't know exactly what goes on in etcd, but it's essentially, at least I think of it as a distributed key value store. It has some sort of consensus algorithm. Uh, maybe we can, we can find out what it is. Oop. Are we done? Contain oh, okay. So container Linux is discontinued, but etcd lives on. Uh, okay, so it, it, uses, it uses Raft, which is kind of like the successor to Paxos. Um, key value data stored with etcd is automatically distributed and replicated with automatic master election and consensus establishment using the Raft algorithm. All changes stored, all changes in stored data are re reflected across the entire cluster, while the achieved redundancy prevents failures of single cluster members from causing data loss. Okay, so um, etcd is just going to be a key value store that uses Raft for consensus. And then we have some API server. Well, what is the API server? Well, it just is the, the application programmer interface to, to, um, to Kubernetes. And if you change stuff in the API server, it's gonna write stuff to etcd. There's a scheduler, which is gonna schedule jobs. And um, there's there are all the kubelets in the kube proxy. So each node has a kubelet, which is the thing that essentially going to be the client for the Kubernetes master, whatchamacallits. Kube proxy is basically just handling uh, networking data, making sure that packets flow to the various nodes as you want them to. Um, and then there's this controller stuff. And I think there's a real sense in which the, the heart of Kubernetes is just, is the control loop. So that's, so that's the hard part. Um, and a, a control loop or a control system or or what have you um, is a really basic concept, I think, in engineering. But the idea is you have some system that changes over time. Like, for example, jobs scheduled on, on the cluster change over time. And you have some goal state. Um, in this case, maybe the goal state is I want my job to run on like four clusters or whatever. And then a control loop's purpose in life is to to first of all monitor the gold state, so like figure out what the what the current what the current state of the world is, compare that to the goal state, and then have some sort of rectifying behavior. And this is the sort of thing that you know, for example, thermostats do. So thermostats measure the temperature of the of the room, and then if it if the temperature is too, it has deviated too much from the desired temperature, then it either um, turns on the the air conditioning by by pumping heat out of the room. Or turns on the heat by pumping heat into the room, and that's that's a that's a basic control loop. And so the heart of Kubernetes um, is, in my opinion, this control loop. And then if you if you've heard of like CRDs or uh, maybe various other things, you can extend Kubernetes by by essentially like leveraging the control uh, architecture to deploy things. So Kubernetes obviously is is specialized in deploying like jobs, binaries, containers to a fleet, but you can also have Kubernetes um, control other systems. So for example, um, for those of you who have used something like um, the, uh, the HashiCorp um, kind of, uh, not Vault, but um, Terraform, you can build a Terraform-like thing out of Kubernetes and you can have Kubernetes, like you can create, you know, you can write YAML that says, you know, I want to have um, a, a database in Virginia or whatever, or um, I want to have a user named answer everywhere. And, and that user is going to have, you know, read permissions on this service. And you can, you can create a system that just, um, that, that allows you to express all of that in YAML and Kubernetes will actuate those, those resources for you as well. And so there are systems that are, that are built like this. And in fact, um, somewhere, so there's, a, there's another paper, um, from Google that describes internally what their, um, see if I can find this. Yeah, so there's this other paper that describes what internally their system is for deploying things. Um, and I, I forget what, the, uh, okay, so there, these are called ProdSpec and annealing. ProdSpec is essentially like a description language 
and annealing is the system that does uh, annealing. It changes the the state so that um, so that it looks like what it's supposed to look like. Um, and so here's here's some diagram. We've got some sort of infrastructure providers. There's a control plane. Uh, <laughs> maybe this diagram is not is not so so important. But um, oh wait, I'm missing on stuff because I have the uh, the the. Here we go. Now I'm seeing more of the lines. So, um, uh, so this is their like this is Google's like infrastructure as a service thing, um, and a corresponding thing might be something like Terraform or like Terraform plus like a continuous integration um, system, or like Argo CD is kind of in the same space. But um, one thing I, I thought was interesting was uh, they built this whole system called annealing, um, and they say Kubernetes is probably the closest similar system. So how is that? So annealing is doing Terraform stuff, right? And Kubernetes is supposedly doing container orchestration stuff, and they're not related. You know, cloud resources or or um, or whatever are not uh, are not necessarily containers, right? And so, uh, but, but it goes on and says Kubernetes was independently started by Google around the same time as Prodspec and annealing. Initially, Kubernetes aimed to be a container orchestration system built upon a framework for declarative service management. Um, it was a greenfield project, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the nature of infrastructure in the open world, as in outside of Google, requires Kubernetes to be flexible and accommodate many different styles of production management. So it's a really general solution is what they're saying. Because you have to, you know, the goal is to get people who are not used to just Google's internal infrastructure to be able to use it for their infrastructure as well. Um, in contrast, Prospect and annealing are essentially customized to Google. And so while the problem spaces are similar, the goals and constraints of Kubernetes were different. As a result, prior prioritizations and solutions were different. This is a case of coevolution, and it's clear that many of the project's foundational aspects ended up being similar, at least on the surface. For example, Kubernetes CRD and prod spec assets fill a similar need. Um, and then it says like Terraform is kind of a similar thing. So, you know, I think there's a sense in which um, had these not been required, you know, had these not been developed at the same time, there's a chance that Google would just internally use um, Kubernetes for for doing things like um, rolling out jobs and, and rolling back jobs, and all, all those sorts of things. Um, okay, so that that's Kubernetes. That's kind of how how I think about it in, in general terms. Um, and then Wises says, "Hello, hi everyone, hi Wises, how's everyone doing?" All right. So without without set file the way, let's look at at Kubernetes, and um, you know my main goal here is to to get. I would like to see the the control loop. Uh, I would like to see the stuff around the control loop. I'm going to think of the API as something that's not super interesting. I'm going to think about stuff like services, and um, and pods as sort of um, implementation details. Uh, for the application of Kubernetes that is orchestrating containers. So we'll get to those if we can. But what I really want to get to is kind of the the more of the guts, more of the, the control stuff. OK, and so, uh, so we're in Go. So I think that maybe package is the place to be. I expect them to have lots of good tests. Um, so I'm not going to look so much at that. Off is is probably interesting. Capabilities, I'm not sure. Cloud provider, no. I'm guessing controller, maybe control plane. There's some credential stuff, features, field path generated, cube API server, cube control, which is the command line utility, kubelet, which is the um, little agent essentially that runs on each of the nodes. I guess we might as well look at kubelet. Probes and proxies and uh, quota, registry and routes or routes, scheduler, I think is interesting. Security context, service account, mm, maybe, and then util and volume. I don't know what a volume is. I'm going to get some sort of maybe like file volume. RBD, iSCSI. Yeah, I'm, I think this is like file file system stuff. And then Ceph's, Ceph, FS. Okay, so let's start. Let's start here with the controllers and the control plane, and maybe I think um, 
maybe cubelet before control plane. I'm thinking control plane may not be so important. Oh, maybe it is. Controller reconcilers. Okay, I'll move I'll move control plane back over here. So it's in controller. I'll just quickly scroll through. We've got a controller ref manager, controller utils, stateful set, which is the, the thing that I think is underlying um what's it called? Pods or um workloads. I'm forgetting my, my cube control commands for a second. Um, we have namespaces are here. Job, garbage collector, cron job daemon. Um, these seem like the, this is maybe a little bit higher in the stack. So these are all things that are, um, that I recognize as like features of the, um, of the job scheduling world of Kubernetes, Th things like stateful sets, service accounts, um, resource claims, replication, replica sets, pods. So I'm going to maybe move this down. And it wasn't control plane. Here we saw controller and reconcilers. And I think this tab is confusing me, so I'll get rid of it. So controllers and reconcilers, um, I think are going to be important. In fact, I'm going to take this control plane window and move it to its own thing. Um, and then we have client util controller dot go. Do we have controller test? Let's look at controller dot go. Actually, let's also look at controller test. How big is this test? 591 lines. That's not a lot. And it's checking stuff about services, service type, et cetera. Okay, I'm not sure. Let's look at the controller.go. In the package control plane, and we're importing some stuff. Um, we're importing API machinery, which I don't really know entirely what that is, but also some core V1, which is like uh, API version stuff. Um, logging, I think is what K log is. We're importing this, um, is this not where we are? Package control plane reconciler. Oh, we're in controller. Okay. But that's, I guess, related file. <laughs> the Kubernetes service name is Kubernetes. Okay. So this is controller is the controller manager for the core bootstrap Kubernetes controller loops which manage creating the Kubernetes services and provide the IP repair check on service IPs. So core bootstrap sounds promising. Controller loops. Um, so the controller is a, some struct and the struct has a bunch of stuff, including a client, informers, which sounds like it might be um, communicating the things that are watching this control loop or it's doing some sort of message broker type service, um, an IP registry, an IP range for the service cluster. And then we have a secondary service cluster stuff, the same, same stuff, IP stuff, um, an IP interval, which is a duration. I'm not sure what an IP interval is. Maybe this is like how long we have, um, some IP range. In fact, these are ranges. So maybe we're like leasing IP ranges and they, they might expire or something. I'm not sure. We have an endpoint reconciler and a duration for the endpoint interval. We have a public IP. And then we have um, a service IP, a service port, and a public service port, and a runner which is an async runner, which sounds pretty general. So presumably it's going to somehow run jobs or job like things asynchronously. And then we have this function.
You have this function, um, new bootstrap controller, which in Go, um, there's nothing like a new, there's nothing like a new keyword. So there's this um, common idiom to call something new if it's going to basically allocate an object, configure it, and return it. So this is something that's going to return to some sort of bootstrap controller, which is of type completed config, I guess. And what does it take in? It takes in something about legacy REST storage and a Kubernetes interface. I guess the client is a Kubernetes interface. So presumably some sort of, it basically takes in something about storage and a client. And, um, oh, it's going to return a control in an error. And I forgot that in Go, this thing here is saying that this is a function, I guess, on the struct or whatever uh, object creator uh, completed config. And the return values are, are on the right. OK. Um, so we're going to get the so what's it do? say? So a uh, new bootstrap controller returns a controller for watching the core capabilities of the, of the master. All right. So it's going to get the host port, check for errors. Um, the Kubernetes default service is a single stack based on a configured service IP range. If the bootstrap controller reconciler, the bootstrap controller reconciler. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Let's try this again. If the bootstrap controller reconcile the kubernetes.default service and endpoints, it must guarantee that the service cluster IP and the associated endpoints have the same IP family, or it will not work for clients because of the IP family mismatch. And then there's something to check out possible enhancements with dual stack. We look at, we peek at the reconciler type, compare it, compare it to the none endpoint reconciler type. And if they're not the same, then we check whether um, our IP range is, is IPv4 CIDR, uh, or rather the result of is IPv4 CIDR is not equal to, um, the result of, uh, of doing our, is IPv4 on the public address. So I'm not sure what, what exactly it's doing. I guess it's checking whether some CIDR range is, is part of the same um, range is the public address. And then we're, if so, we're, if that, if that doesn't happen, then we're going to error out and then we're going to return this controller. And this is basically configuring, configuring some struct by setting things. So the client is going to be the same client we passed in. The informers are going to be C. What is C? Uh, C is the, the thing that we're, is like the object we're part of. Um, we're going to get the version informers from that object, basically from this, I guess. And then um, we're going to populate things like endpoint reconciler. And every, a lot of stuff seems to be coming from this, essentially. And we, we populate this controller object. It's big source, source code. How many parts are you planning to host? To host or to, um, to look at? I'm going to, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to look at a huge amount. I think I'm going to, um, I think I'm mostly going to, going to try to, to see, to see what's up with the control stuff and then at least get a flavor for, um, you know, now that we have control, how do we build things like what, what like pods or services? Um, but we may only look at like one of those. Um, so we're just creating some configuration object basically. Awesome. Thank you. Never know. Um, and then we've got some hooks. We have a post start hook, which initiates the core controller loops that must exist for bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is of course the same metaphor that's used for like booting up a computer. If you think of, um, I think that's right. So, so booting or rebooting a computer, I think was originally short for bootstrapping, which of course is a reference to pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps, which I think might come from the uh, Baron Munchauser. I'm not sure if we're going to get a real like etymology. 
Pirates of the Caribbean. Anyway, there's some story where a character pulls himself like out of a swamp or something or out of like water with his bootstraps. Um, and um, I'm not sure if that's the origin of the phrase, but that, I think that's at least an early occurrence of it. And so we're going to bootstrap, I guess, uh, if you think of the, the Kubernetes as the cluster operating system in the same way that um, Linux or Windows or Mac OS is your, uh, is your single machines operating system, then this, this is presumably the essentially the bootstrap process. Can I elaborate more on bootstrap in this context? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, do you mean uh, elaborate how bootstrapping works in Kubernetes? Because that I don't, I don't know. I mean, we could look that up. I mean, that, that's essentially what we're finding out now. Um, but you know who might know about that is um, Bard. Let's see if Bard is around. So how does ask how does bootstrapping work? I mean, we, we can think of some of the things that the bootstrapping process has to do. It has to like set up the API server. It has to make sure that etcd is running. Um, it has to set up whatever is needed for credentials. So bootstrapping is the process of creating a new Kubernetes cluster from scratch and getting it up and running. It involves setting up the control plane and worker nodes and determining which node is the correct information with which all the other nodes should synchronize. There are two main ways to bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster. Manual bootstrapping, uh -huh, um, which involves configuring all the components such as etcd, kube API server, kube scheduler, kube controller manager, and kubelet. And automatic bootstrapping it involves using a tool like kubeadmin to automate the process. Okay, and then it's going to give us some sort of tutorial, which I'm going to ignore. So according to this, at least, bootstrapping means creating a new cluster. So let's look. And there's so much. Um, Kubernetes is hard enough that there's like a whole cottage industry around people trying to clarify uh, Kubernetes or, or create tools around it. So just for simplicity, I'll... I'll um, restrict my search to the official Kubernetes docs just to make sure we get something reasonably up to date. Um, so yeah, okay. So, so, uh, this is telling you about bootstrapping clusters with kubeadmin, which seems like, um, that's consistent with what chat, not chat GPT, but, um, Bard was telling me. So, but I'm not sure that this is the, the only, the only thing, the only use of the, the term bootstrapping in this context, but um, we'll assume that it, that that this might be the case. What have I done with my, um, here we go. So we've got a post startup hook and we've got a pre shut down hook. Um, and so this is going to be some hook after we're started up, we might need to do some things. We might need to tell our friends that we're started up. Um, and before shutting down, we might need to clean up some stuff. So this is basically, you know, we're, we're ready. We're going to do some stuff. This is, uh, we're about to shut down. Let's cleanly get rid of anything else we need. We, anything else we need to turn down. So this is triggers the actions needed to shut down the API server cleanly. And then we have start. Start begins the core controller loops that must exist for bootstrapping a cluster. And what do we have? So we've got start. We're just going to check if C runner is nil, um, which is not so interesting. We're going to create an endpoint port spec, which says reconcile during the first run, removing itself until server is ready. Um, I'm not really sure. I guess endpoint is like the where you're going to send stuff to. Um, we need some specification for it. I'm not sure exactly what's in it. We're going to try to repair some stuff. We've got a port allocator controller. Um, and it says repair port nodes, repair node ports. Um, this might be trying to find an open port. I'm not sure. Um, we've got a, the weight group stuff. I'm not sure about, um, in go, but I think essentially under the hood, it's some sort of lock. A weight group is like a, a, a like a, a group of locks that are going to maybe all wait with each other. 
We start both repair cluster IPs and repair node ports to ensure repair loops of cluster IPs and node ports. Okay. Um, so it sounds like um, really fundamental to, to getting a cluster bootstrapped or making sure that we repair the, the cluster IPs and the node ports. And so you might know node port from like configuring a, a service uh, in Kubernetes. I forget exactly the details, but um, node ports can be used to do things like uh, um, instead of having some sort of like load balancer or ingress, um, just exposing the port that the container is running on on the host machine. And so I guess without node ports, uh, Kubernetes wouldn't really be able to talk to other hosts. Um, this this sort of sounds like it. Uh, this has to be there underneath whatever fancier stuff you build on top of it. It says we run we we run both repair loops using the run until public interface. However, we want to fail liveness or readiness until the first successful repair loop. So we basically pass appropriate callbacks to run util methods. Okay, so um, we're going to run, but we don't like uh, liveness and readiness or or probes types of probes that are used to detect if services are, are up and running. So um, remember I, I mentioned like thermostat. So, so thermostat needs to do one thing. One is it essentially needs to control some sort of pump that's pumping heat into or out of your room or your some box of its refrigerator. Um, the other thing it needs to do is it needs to know what the state of the temperature is. And so it has some sort of uh, thermostat to, to do that, right? Or um, I think thermostat is the name of the whole controller, but it has some sort of temp thermometer. <laughs> there you go. Some sort of thermometer to, to actually tell what the what the temperature is. And then um, similarly in Kubernetes, we need some way of knowing whether your pods or whatever or your your containers are running. And the way that it does that is probes. So just like a, a thermometer probes in some way um, the the ambient temperature. We have uh, you know software is going to have some sort some some probes. And um, they're saying we want to fail the liveness probes um, until the first successful repair loop. So if we never get a successful repair loop, we don't want anyone to think that we're, that we're like, okay. So we wait, we wait until we get a success in that sense. Additionally, we ensure that we don't wait for it for it for longer than one minute for backward compatibility of failing the whole API server if we can't repair them. Okay, so don't wait longer than one minute for some backward compatibility reason. So we've got some uh, wait group. And we've got this node repair, uh, run repair node ports, which is a function essentially, um, I guess like a, I was gonna say a Lambda, but it's not anonymous, but some some function object. Um, that's gonna take a Chan, a stop Chan, stop Cha, which is some Go channel. Um, and I don't really know under the hood what's going on with Go channels, but I'm gonna think of them as, um, just like inter process or inter thread, uh, communication channels. Um, and then we're going to, in the function is going to call repair node ports dot run until on whatever WG dot done and with the stop channel. And this, is this the same function? Oh, okay. No, this is run repair node ports. I thought this was recursively defined, but we have an extra run in front here. So this is just some function that's ba that's basically operating as a lambda to call this inner function, and then whatever wait group add is actually let's let's look up um, go wait groups. So wait groups are going to wait for some go routine, which is essentially a coroutine, I think, um, to wait for multiple coroutines to finish, I guess. And I don't know what add L, add one means. Let's see what the add function does. Is 
Is this some sort of like reference counting of delta integer? Add adds delta, which may be negative, to the weight group counter. If the counter becomes zero, all go routines blocked on weight are released. If the counter goes negative, add panics. This seems like some kind of like reference counting thing. How many, how much stuff is waiting for this? Okay. And so, um, and then we've got this run repair cluster IDs, sorry, cluster IPs. And we're going to check if some features enabled default feature, uh, multi-sider stuff, I guess. And, um, depending whether multi-sider is enabled, we're going to be in one of these two clauses. I'm going to create the run repair cluster IPs object in either case. Then we're going to take an, we're going to get a new async runner. Um, we're going to pass it the run Kubernetes service thing, which is inside C. And we're also going to pass it the two essentially, uh, callbacks. It looks like that are going to start the repair, the corresponding repair loops. And then we're going to start the runner. And then it says for backward compatibility, we ensure that if we never are able to repair cluster IPs or node ports, we not only fail the liveness or readiness, but we also explicitly fail. So, um, got this done thing. And I guess we're going to create a go function that's going to, uh, defer close on done and wait. I'm not sure entirely what that does, but here's a description of what it's supposed to do. I think I just read and then select, um, I don't remember. I think that seems like a switch statement. Um, and if the, I'm not sure. Time after a minute, unable to perform. Oh, I think we're still inside the go function. Um, but this is basically going to shut down, I guess, either if we're done or, um, we've waited a minute, something like that. And we can, and then here's the stop function, which is presumably just going to do a bunch of cleanup. Let me look up, uh, go. Select statements. I thought there was a traditional switch as well. Yeah, we have a switch statement, but I'm not sure what select statements are. Go select. Oh, there's something about channels. Okay. The select statement in Go allows us to execute a channel among many alternatives. Before you learn about select, make sure you understand Go channel. Well, I don't, I'm going to plow on anyway. Um, here in each case, uh, each case of the select represents an individual channel and based on the availability of the channel operations, the select statement executes a channel with this, this has select case, first channel, case, second channel, case, third channel. Um, this selects and executes a channel case, first channel. We'll do some stuff. Case, second channel. We'll do some other stuff. I'm not sure how it chooses what to select. We've created two channels, number and message. Here we have you two go routines, channel number and channel message to send data to the respective channels. The program includes two separate channels. So we have used the select statement to execute one of the channels among the two. Here, the case first channel gets the value from the number channel and prints it. Um, similarly, the case second channel gets the value from the message channel and prints it. When you run this program, you might get different outputs. In our example, both channels are ready for execution. So the select statement executes the channel randomly. So different, okay. So I guess, um, different channels might be, have different readiness states and you execute based on readiness state. And if everything is ready, it does some sort of round Robin of the channels. Um, should we look into go channels? I guess make, create some sort of channel and, um, Presumably you can send stuff to it. You can send data to the channel with this left arrow. You can receive data. The syntax to receive data from the channel is, I guess the channel goes on the right. And then you have left arrow to, I guess, receive, receive data 15. Yeah. Okay. So here's make and make, and here's receiving a, a number. And then here's sending a message to the channel. Okay. That's all relatively straightforward. I think. I'm sure there are many gotchas. 
okay, so this select statement is, um, I guess, if finish reconciling is, is ready, then we're going to run that. Otherwise, if this, I guess, whatever this other thing is, if we're after this time, this this thing is ready, and, we're, and that's and that's going to help us stop. Um, here's run Kubernetes service. Run Kubernetes service periodically updates the Kubernetes service. Okay, so we're going to wait until process is ready. So we're going to pull, I guess, until things are ready, and then uh, we've got this non-sliding until. Which I'm not sure. Wait, non-sliding until which is going to take a function. It says service definition is not reconciled after first run. Ports and type will be corrected only during start. And then we try to update the Kubernetes service. And if there's an error, we'll error out. And we also give it some um, some endpoint interval. And the polling thing is going to take some time to poll, I guess, and uh, essentially a function object. And it's going to look at ready Z, which is presumably going to be populated when the thing is ready. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess we're, I'm not sure if we're reading or setting the code, but we're doing whatever do with the code is, is doing, um, uh, we're going to, I guess if it's successful, we're going to reset the return code to status. Okay. With nil error. I'm not sure what non sliding until is, but I guess I'll look that up. I guess it's part of API machinery. Actually, you know what, let's, um, since we can, let's open this controller thing in, um, in Emacs. What are we, package control plane controller? So now we should be able to just go to this function. At some time. Okay, so non sliding until. Non sliding until loops until stop channel is closed, running f every period. So you're passing in, in some function f is the first argument. And you're going to run periodically until the stop channel is closed. Non sliding until is syntactic sugar on top of jitter until with zero jitter. And this file is in backoff.go. So there should be something about backoff. So let's look at jitter until. So jitter until it takes, I guess, a function, a duration, um, a, uh, a jitter factor, whether it's sliding, and it's calling back off until. And then back off until loops until the stop channel is closed, running f every duration given by back off manager. If sliding is true, the period is computed after f runs. If it is false, then the period includes the runtime for f. Okay, so I guess the difference is whether or not we include F's runtime as well. And uh, this is a, looks like a fairly straightforward function. So we've got some clock timer and four. I guess this is maybe a, an infinite for loop because there's nothing, there's no guard or whatever for the four. And we're going to select the channel. If the stop channel is ready to execute, I guess is how to read this, maybe. Then we're going to return as in stop. And then default is. I guess the empty channel, which means continue, I suppose. If we're not sliding, then we're going to get the back off and set it to T. Um, and we've got this handle crash function that I guess we're, we're uh, oh, I see. We're going to call F essentially in a, in a um, uh, function object, but we're going to have, um, you know, if F crashes, I guess we're going to defer this handle crash stuff. Um, and if we are sliding, we're going to compute back off again. Now that F is run. And then uh, we're going to check, I guess, stop channel again. 
And we have this note. Note, because there's no priority selection in Golang, it is possible for this to race, meaning we could trigger t.c and stop ch, and t.c select falls through. In order to mitigate, we recheck stop ch at the beginning of every loop to prevent extra executions of f. OK, so there's race prevention by, by checking stuff multiple times. Um, and then back off dot back off. Where are we now? Back off until this should be. Presumably at some point we get exponential back off. You would think, but we'll see. The back off manager handles back off with a particular scheme based on the underlying implementation. What is going on? I want to print this. Back off returns a shared clock timer that is reset on every invocation. This method is not safe for use in multiple threads. So it's not thread safe. It returns a timer for a back off and caller shall back off until timer.c drains. If the second back off is not called before the timer from the first back off, the call finishes, the first timer will not be drained and result in undetermined behavior. Okay. So it's just some clock timer. We do have an exponential back off manager implementation. See if we have other exponential stuff. New exponential backoff manager returns a manager for managing exponential backoff. Each backoff is jittered, etc. So how's this related to backoff? So we get an initial backoff, a max backoff. Do we return a backoff thing object? Yeah. Okay. So an exponential thing, exponential backoff manager or whatever, is an object that um, ra that that essentially wraps a backoff object with some other stuff. We've got a back off factor. But I didn't, I don't remember seeing factor here. Oh, we, the back off is a struct. Okay. Where's the factor? Factor is a float 64. Factor is duration. Uh, duration is multiplied by factor at each iteration. If factor is not zero and the limits imposed by steps and cap have not been reached, should not be negative. Okay, so this is where we get exponential back off. We've got some back off factor. Cool. All right, so uh, where are we? We're in the controller. So whatever, so non-sliding, I guess, means don't include the um, the runtime of this function, this up, update Kubernetes function when, when computing the back off, it sounds like. And then, but otherwise, we're gonna run this in a loop I guess possibly with exponential back off. Sounds good. And the thing we're running in the loop is update Kubernetes service, which is the next function, which is going to attempt to update the default cube service. And it's going to take a Boolean about, about what to reconcile. It says update service and endpoint records. Um, it's in, and some to do's. So we're going to try to create the namespace if needed. We're going to create port and service spec using a bunch of stuff we already have in, in structs because we're in this, this controller object. And so these are other, I guess, objects that are in the same struct. And okay. So we're going to try to create the namespace. We're going to try to create port and service spec, and we're going to try to create endpoint port spec and possibly error out. And that's all we're going to try to do. Okay, so let's look at create. And so one of these is the create port and service spec, which should take um, a service port, a target service port, a node port, a service port name, and what else? So this just creates an array of service ports. If the node port value is zero, just the service port is used. Otherwise, a node port is exposed. So use the cluster IP type for the service port if node port isn't provided. Otherwise, we'll be binding the master service to a node port. We're going to create this service port object. Um, check if node port is zero, and then we're just going to return whatever service ports is. So what is changing?
doesn't seem like much is, is changing. This is just creating an object, creating another object, checking if node port is bigger than zero, and then returning it. So it's just creating some spec. Um, here's create or update master service if needed. We'll create the specified service if it doesn't already exist. So, okay. So if the service already exists, um, I guess reconcile should be set to true. Then we're going to try to get master service update if needed. Presumably this does something like call out to, to, um, uh, the, the at CD. Um, but if we don't need to reconcile, I guess we ignore this and we go here and we just try to create some objects, I guess, based on, on what's in the struct. Um, and we call create or update master service if needed. If we get an error that it already exists. Um, but the thing that might give us an error is this create function. So let's actually look into, I guess, um, let's go create. So create's going to take a context dot to do a service and some create options. So this should be something that's calling ultimately out, out to the distributed database. Okay, so here's the service interface has methods for working with service resources. Okay, so this is just some interface. And here's the create one. And I go to, you like xref, go to cross-references? No? All right, can I do, I can go to definition. Can I find usages? I don't think I can. Maybe um, see if I can find an implementation. So create takes the representation of a service and creates it. Returns the server's representation of the service and an error, if there is any. So create, um, we're gonna create this empty object for the result. Okay, and so the client is gonna post some stuff. The client is posting which makes sense. Um, and so this is just calling a, a RESTful interface, right? We dig into post. Uh, here's client.go. Interface captures the set of operations for generically interacting with the Kubernetes REST APIs. Here we can find an implementation of post. Post is just going to call, <laughs> call c.verb of post. And verb is presumably going to be the thing that, um, here we go. So verb is going to create a new request and call verb on it. The new request creates a new request helper object for accessing the runtime objects on a server. The new request has a back off manager, which is good. And it's going to check some stuff about the back off manager. We're going to check, the, I guess, the base path. And we have a timeout duration, which we're going to get from the client. And then we're going to create this request object, which has um, C, which is the REST client in this context, and a rate limiter, and a back off configuration, and a timeout configuration of some sort, um, path prefix. Um, I'm not sure if everything is relative to the same uh, uh, top level, whatever, uh, part, uh, host part of the URL, I'm not sure. Um, and then a maximum number of retries and some retry function, which is set to a default and some, some handler for warnings. So we're going to create this request. I don't think we've done anything with it, but now we're going to switch on some stuff. We're going to switch on, um, I guess what kind of content types we're we're accepting. And uh, depending on what, are, what kind of content types we're accepting, we are going to set appropriate headers, and then we're just going to return the request. Now this request object has some sort of verb 
um, verb thing magic that should actually be sending it. Um, should we find verb? So verb just sends the verb. Okay, so sets the the verb this request will use. Okay. What actually sends it? The request has also has things like body, etc. I think that sends it ultimately should be REST client, right? So there's some REST client that's got a bit, things like a base URL um, and it holds like a Golang HTTP client, but I think we're in Kubernetes still, right? So this is kind of some Kubernetes wrapper around the Go HTTP client, which has things like, I guess, config. Content describes how a REST client encodes and decodes responses. We've got a back off manager, a flow control rate limiter, a URL, an API version st string, and handlers for warnings. And then ultimately we're just gonna call out the client. And, and somewhere there should be stuff like um, authentication and authorization, right? So we should know kind of what bearer tokens to send. Let's see if bearer, um, somewhere, I'm not sure. What if I do find, uh, yeah, so, okay, in, in, um, in config.go, I guess there's bearer stuff. So config.go has some sort of bearer token string. Server requires bearer authoriza authorization. The client will not attempt to use refresh tokens for an OAuth2 flow. And this, uh, it can be a bearer token file. Okay, so this is, uh, I believe that this is just a REST, uh, REST um, client. So let's go back to controller. So what did we see? Well, we saw that create or update master service if needed. We'll take a bunch of config st stuff that's in structs and ultimately it's going to post something to the, to the API. And it's going to do that with a, um, just a standard rest client. And so there's various layers of, um, of configuration around that to, to make the client easy to program in a Kubernetes environment so that each, you know, as you're adding new calls, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just use whatever struct or, or object is, um, is is already configured and has all the nice stuff connected to it. Um, and we've got stuff about setting attributes. We can check service format. And that's the end of controller.go. Okay, so let's take a look at reconciler. So what did what did we see? Well controller.go seems to um, mainly call things in loops with callbacks and back off appropriately. And there doesn't seem to be anything especially mysterious or tricky about what it's doing. So let's look at uh, reconcilers. Um, Wait a minute, can I do, oh. What are you done? I don't know what's going on. Okay, so here's reconcilers.go. We've got an endpoint reconciler interface.
So, um, so here's Reconciler. We've got some endpoint Reconciler inter, uh, interface thing, which has got some Reconcile endpoints, remove endpoints, stop. Oh, this is, oh, this is an interface. So these are like functions you can call. Um, you can reconcile endpoints, remove endpoints, stop reconciling, or destroy. Uh, reconcile endpoints sets the endpoint for the given API server, which can be, I guess, read only or read write. Reconcile endpoints expects the endpoint objects it manages will all be managed only by reconcile endpoints. So you shouldn't, I guess, try to manage through some other mechanism. To understand this, you need only to understand the requirements. The requirements, all API servers must use the same ports for their read, read, write, and read only services. All API servicers must use reconcile endpoints and only reconcile endpoints to manage the endpoints for their uh, read, write, and read only services. And reconcile endpoints is called periodically from all API servers. So the API servers, I believe, should just be running on the master, on the master nodes. Um, and then we've got this function reconcile endpoints. And that's, I think, what I want to see. Okay. Um, there must be some jump to implementation thing, right? No? And we have reconcilers.go, which is where we are. Lease. Um, look at lease. Lease is in the same directory, right? So I guess lease endpoint reconciler is maybe an implementation of this general reconciler interface. Yeah, I think. Think in Go, this is kind of, um, I don't know. Here's some struct. Um, all right, we don't, in Go, you don't need to say that you are implementing an, um, an interface, right? You just need to go ahead and implement all the methods. Um, but so whatever least endpoint reconciler is, it seems to be a reconciler, a thing that implements reconciler. And it's got an endpoint adapter, some leases, master leases and whether stop has been called and a mutex for a mutual exclusion. Let's see what a lease is. A lease is an interface which assists in managing the set of active masters. Okay, so um, this is the thing that presumably is going to, so this, ma mm, this manages active masters. Um, I don't think, um, I think leadership is, is different from masters. So masters should just be, just be whether you're a master node and then somehow they're going to vie for leadership within that. Um, so you're going to, we can list, we can list leases, update leases, remove leases and destroy them. And we have a storage lease. And the leases seem to be strings. Uh, in fact, when we call update lease, all we're passing it is a string, which says IP. So it sounds like we're going to give it um, the IP address and that'll, uh, that is what, what a lease is. Is that right? List leases is going to return a list of strings or possibly an error. Yep. And it says it masters IPs. Okay. So a lease is just some list of IP addresses. Actually, let's look at list leases implementation. So we're going to create an end, an endpoints list. We've got the storage ops stuff. I'm not really sure what's going on with storage, but um, we're going to call it get list on storage. I guess storage is a wrapper around uh, maybe at CD. That's the distributed storage thingamajig. And maybe it's called storage because at some point you might want to plug in a different, um, a different non at CD database. And then we're just going to create this IP list channel, I guess. Is that what, that's what make does, right? Then we're going to loop over some stuff. Is any of the stuff sending some stuff to the channel? We're just going to call append on the IP list. So I think make um, isn't maybe isn't just for channels, right? I think you can, I think you can use it to make things like arrays, if I remember. I'm going to return IP list. Okay. 
Now I'm curious about um, storage. So let's look at just where st what storage is. The interfaces. The LSP server is very slow. I think it's trying to go somewhere. Okay. Okay. So precondition. I'm just. I just did a search for etcd. CD. It says preconditions must be fulfilled before an operation update, etc. Oh, that's just etc. See if I can find um, etcd somewhere. There, there are a bunch of references to etcd, um, but we have storage backend factory etcd3. And whatever, we're in the etcd3 file in the storage backend factory. What other factories do we have? We just have factory. Create. Create creates a storage backend based on the given config. Okay. And what are our types? We have etcd2 and etcd3. Okay, so etcd is the only game in town, but I guess in theory you could create new storage backends. So let's like unravel all this stuff and go back to reconcilers. And I wanted to go to reconcile endpoints, which I think I just deleted the file that um, was going to show us an implementation of that. What was it? Lease something or other? Let's look at this one. Okay, so reconcile endpoints from the lease endpoint reconciler is. Uh, going to take um, the service name as a string, an IP address, some endpoint stuff, endpoint ports, and reconcile ports, which is a Boolean. I'm going to re just return an error. Reconcile endpoints. List keys in a special etcd directory. OK, so we're just look up some etcd directory. And each key is expected to have a TTL, a time to live, of r plus n, where r is the refresh interval at which this function is called, and n is some small value, maybe like, like epsilon small, I don't know. If an API server goes down, it will fail to refresh its keys, TTLs, and the key will expire. OK, so we're just going to, I guess, put our keys in some etcd directory with some time to live of like, you know, if this function is called every two seconds, we're going to have the time to live be like 2.1 seconds or, or whatever. And um, that serves as kind of like a, um, I don't think dead man switch is maybe the right metaphor, but um, maybe like a heartbeat sort of thing. Um, and so if the if one of the servers dies, it's not going to be able to update after 2.1 seconds, it won't have updated its, um, its keys anymore. And so I guess maybe from that, we can infer that that server is dead. So it will fail to refresh its keys, TTL, and the key will expire. Reconcile endpoints will notice that the endpoints object is different from the directory listing and update the endpoints object accordingly. OK. So reconcile endpoints is going to just do that. We can get a lock and defer unlocking, I guess, until we've left the function. Um, we're going to check if we've been asked to stop reconciling. And if we haven't, we're going to call update leases on presumably our own IP, but I'll read that comment in about one second. And then we're going to return do reconcile of the endpoint stuff. Um, and then I'm getting a question. Are Etsy D only used as temporary storage? They shouldn't be. Because when I re, I so I have a cluster, um, and when I reboot, I don't have any extra backup stuff going. When I reboot my cluster, all this stuff is still there. But I guess that's a good enough question, um, Ariana, that we should look at. Um, let's look it up 
in about like uh, two minutes. Um, but it should be persistent storage. There are um, there are good questions about backing up like a whole cluster. Um, like I know, um, like if you bork your cluster somehow, there are services that that, that lets you like snapshot a cluster. Um, but I think that's I think that in general, um, etcd should survive reboots. I think of all of the of all of the master nodes. But but let's look that up. Um, actually, one sec. So, um, so update least. So what does this comment say? So refresh the TTL on our key independently, independently of whether any error or update conflict happens below. This makes sure that at least some of the masters will add our, add our endpoint. Okay. So this should be our endpoint as in, I'm guessing that this should be our IP address and then do reconcile. sounds like an important function. So we're going to visit it. And Ariane is asking um, if etcd is only used for temporary storage. So let's look at um, etcd, maybe persistent storage. Um, maybe I'll try Google. The persistent key value store. etcd is designed to reliably store infrequently updated data infrequently updated okay i don't know what infrequently means i guess um when you change your jobs in kubernetes i guess that's considered infrequently as opposed to maybe like the um you're doing uh, trading updating a stock price is probably more frequent and provide reliable watch queries. etcd exposes previous answers, blah, blah, blah. A persistent multi-version concurrency control data model is a good fit for these use cases. etcd stores data in a multi-version persistent key value store. The persistent key value store, blah, blah, blah. So persistent should mean that it persists, not ephemeral. Yeah. Oh, it, that always preserves the previous version of itself when it's modified. Um, so we can also ask, does um, data survive? Reboot. And etcd automatically recovers from temporary failures, for example, machine reboots, and tolerates up to n minus 1 over 2 permanent failures for a cluster of n members. When a member permanently fails, whether due to hardware failure or disruption, it loses access to the cluster. I'm not finding a quick answer to this. Let's try ChatGPT or Bard. Um, does etcd keep um, data across um, when I shut down all, uh, what do you call a collection of members, all members? When you shut down all members, the data is lost. To prevent data loss, you should always have at least two members in your etcd cluster. If one fails, the other member will store the data. So maybe there is something that I'm doing um, kind of implicitly that, that's keeping the data stored. Let's ask ChatGPT. Whether etcd keeps data when you shut down depends on how you've configured the cluster. Okay. That seems more reasonable. Uh, 
if we store with persistent data, then everything will be stored on disk. It'll be available even after the members are shut down. But it sounds like it's a configuration option. I'm going to stop ChatGPT from generating because it seems to be really struggling. OK. I'm going to shut down some of these um, browser windows I had opened. OK. So let's look at do reconcile. So that, um, Ariane, I, I think, I hope that answers your question. So the answer is, Maybe if you've configured it to do it that way, it seems like that it seems like that's the case. Uh, so do reconcile. I'm going to take a service name, some endpoints, endpoint ports, and reconcile ports. And this is still in lease, so this doesn't seem to be like a general reconcile function. Whatever app adapter is, we're going to get the some core namespace and service stuff. What is R? R is the lease reconciler. So that should create the false, check some errors, um, get the leases list of master IPs from the leases. Check that we have more than zero uh, masters. Um, something I'm mirroring. Next, we compare the current list of endpoints with the list of master IP keys. So we're going to check endpoint subset format with lease. And uh, I guess this is the thing that's actually checking if all the all the IPs are as we expect them to do. If we shouldn't create, so if we if we should create, then we're gonna call create. Otherwise, we're gonna call update. Um, I guess if we don't have the correct IP, we'll repopulate the addresses according to the expected IPs from etcd, and do some stuff. This lexicographic order is retained by this step. The repack subsets. Hmm. Okay, so that's lease. Um, and uh, is this is this, is this how it's going to work in general? So here's a theory. Here's a here's a conjecture that everything is going to work basically the same way. We have, um, you know, something's going to emit a heartbeat. Um, it's going to basically call like touch on a file essentially, which resets the timestamp. But it's going to do that. Um, periodically, and then there's going to be something that listens on a loop, or, or not listens, but there's something that, that, that runs in a loop that's going to check whether um, those updated leases match, so, so those updated timestamps essentially match the expected state. And um, if it doesn't, then there's presumably some sensible way to, to reconcile them. So uh, will that work in general? I, I, I don't think it will work in general um, because uh, some things are probed, right? So instead of, uh, you know, when you write some container, um, you don't write logic that, um, that like pings the, um, that pings the etcd service periodically and, and says I'm still alive. Instead, what happens um, is you implement some probe target that just returns like HTTP 200 OK. Um, and Kubernetes sends out probes. So there's some, uh, you know, some service that probes your stuff. And presumably under the hood, that's going to like write your, um, that's going to update your timestamps. So not everything is like reaching out to the a API server. Sometimes it seems like thing, the, 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 sometimes Kubernetes is reaching out to you and checking if you're still okay. Um, and so that, there's two different ways of doing very similar things. Um, does that cover everything? I don't know. I'll have to think about that like for a second, but it seems like in general, um, that's the sort of thing we're going to have to do, right? We have to, um, We've got this distributed database that we can achieve consensus on. It's really the only thing we can achieve consensus on because it's the only thing running the, the wrapped consensus algorithm. So, um, so we're going to have to somehow uh, bootstrap from that into getting all of the nice control behaviors. Um, so it seems like whatever observability information we, 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 we need. We're going to store that in etcd and compare that with an intended state. And the intended state should be essentially the YAML that you write. And then the question is, 
um, how do things reconcile when there's an issue? And that should be kind of like application dependent. So if, um, to use a, maybe a simple example, let's suppose that I have um, a service that, uh, like a hello world service, and I want two replicas of my hello world binary, then um, I will send Kubernetes some YAML that says I want two hello world binaries. And Kubernetes will, um, periodically, I guess, check the, those binaries, those containers. Um, and if one stops responding, it'll notice that it stops responding via something similar to what we just saw. And it will run a command. And that command should basically be create another, create another, uh, run another copy of the binary somewhere. Um, and so it seems like the, the command to run another copy of the binary should be custom and maybe as part of the, the CRD definition. Um, and is there anything else it's really going to do? Um, like I'm wondering if you have a bunch of different control loops running, um, do you want them to all be synchronized? Do you want them to run on their own clocks? I don't really know how to think about that. Um, but I guess, the next thing maybe that I want to do is that we, since we've seen this for, for endpoints, let's see if we can find other implementations of similar logic, perhaps for, for pods. So why is this saying they have to drop? Because uh, it's quite late. Oh, okay. I'll rewatch the part of the, yeah, thanks man. Or, um, or human or, or, or woman. I tend to say man. So I, I don't mean that in, the, in a gender specific way, but yeah, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Okay, so let's see if we can find um, let's see if we can find something that's gonna that's gonna do something interesting to to the pods, and I guess you know deep inside I want to see if there's anything. Um, maybe there's a more general purpose, more general version of of uh, of reconciler that's not just the control plane. Here's the API server. We've got admission, which should probably be like admission controllers, which is like, you know, when you try to create a thing like a pod, uh, you can write logic that examines the YAML that you created and it will do things like, you know, fail if you're asking for too many resources or whatever. Um, authenticator should be for authentication. Authorizer should be for authorization. Um, probe is presumably the, you know, I mentioned uh, Kubernetes is going to probe you to see if you're still alive. Client is, we saw some of the client stuff. Although I feel like I'm missing files. Cause we saw much more client stuff than is there. Maybe it's in another directory. Here are APIs. What's coordination? We've got things like register. Find resource known types. Let's look up Kubernetes coordination. So we've got this stuff on leases. Distributed systems often have a need for leases. Node heartbeats. Here we go. Kubernetes uses the lease API to communicate kubelet node heartbeats to the Kubernetes API server. For every node, there's a lease object with a matching name in the kube node lease data uh, namespace. Under the hood, each heartbeat is an update request to this lease object, updating the spec renew time field. That's basically what we saw. And for leader election, it says Kubernetes uses leases to ensure that only one instance of the component is running at a given time. This is used by control plane components uh, like controller manager and kube scheduler in HA configurations, I guess high availability, where only one instance of the component should be actively running while the other instances are on standby. And there's some stuff about server identity, which I don't really know what it is. How about um, Kubernetes to write your own control loop? Maybe we can find the entry point for controllers in general. In robotics and automation, a control loop is a non-terminating loop that regulates the state of the system. You know, this is the stuff that I was talking about before. For example, a thermostat. Hey, that's the, that's the standard control, control loop example. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Controller pattern. Controller control via API server. The job controller is an example. Yeah, okay. Um, when the job controller doesn't stop, blah blah blah. Direct control. There's actually a, there actually is a controller that horizontally scales your nodes in your cluster. Yeah. The, so that's an interesting point. So so scaling works the same way. So um, I guess the scaler wouldn't know. You wouldn't tell the scaler that you need like, you know, ten um, machines. You would tell the the scaler that that some condition has to be met. Like I want to not stop serving people because I have too much traffic. And then somehow the scaler is going to like monitor that metric and keep adding nodes until it either runs out of resources or the metric is met. But what I want to see is how you get your how do you make your own controller design. As a tenant of its design, Kubernetes uses lots of controllers that each manage a particular aspect of cluster state. Most commonly, a particular control loop or controller uses one kind of resource as its desired state. Okay, yes, so the resource models the desired state and has a different kind of resource that it manages to make that desired state happen. Okay, so there's a second resource that's essentially kind of like the reconciler. For example, a controller for jobs tracks job objects to discover new work and pod objects to run the jobs and then see when the work is finished. In this case, something else creates the jobs, whereas the job controller creates the pods. It's useful to have simple controllers rather than one monolithic set of control loops that are interlinked. Controllers can fail, so Kubernetes is designed to allow for that. So it sounds like we have lots of little controllers. I don't know how it manages, like sometimes, so, if you have, so a controller, among other things, has some sort of clock. And the clock is going to determine um, when it's going to request new stuff. And so when you have a lot of clocks, um, even if you start them out of sync, they can tend to synchronize because they're all you know running on the same physical device or they're all running in the same data center. And so um, uh, they have there are physical characteristics that are that that can tend to push um, those sorts of oscillators into synchrony. And um, how do you get around that? I'm guessing that you get around that through some combination of back off and jitter, because there doesn't seem to be anything that's like looking at all of the clocks and making sure that, that, that they're not synchronized. Um, but we did see jitter and, um, and back off as pretty first class citizens in the, um, in the, as we dug into the, one of the control loops. So I'm guessing that, that jitter and back off are enough to kind of randomize the behavior somehow. Ways of running controllers. Kubernetes uh, comes with a set of built-in controllers that run inside Kube Controller Manager. These built-in controllers provide important core behaviors. The blah, 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 blah. Extension path. This is what I want, extensions. Extension points. You can have uh, plugins. The scheduler. We should look at the scheduler, I guess. We have device plugins, storage plug plugins. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick look at controller manager. The Kubernetes controller manager is a daemon that embeds the core control loop ships with Kubernetes. I think that's basically what we saw. And they can do things like allocate node ciders, etc. I swear I've seen stuff about how to make controllers. Build a canoe oh, operator. Is that what they're called? The operators are software extensions to Kubernetes that make use of custom resources to manage applications. Um, operators follow Kubernetes principles, notably the control loop. The operator pattern help blah, 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 aims to capture the key aim of a human operator who is managing a service or a set of services. They look after specific applications and services and have deep knowledge of how the system ought to behave. So ought to behave is um, the same as desired state, presumably, and how to react if there are problems is, is basically the reconciler. So I'm guessing this is the same as a, um, I think this is, this is maybe what we want to look at. Deploying operations. So let's look at writing an operator.
I'm just going to open random ones until one decides to open on my system. I don't really see anything. Operator versus controller. Controller is a software component that tracks Kubernetes objects and interacts with them. For example, the admission controller. An operator is a controller that tracks a new resource you can add using a custom resource definition. Okay. Okay, I don't see um, drive custom resource, deserialize, debug. So here's a some resource thing, custom resource thing. You need to add the API resource. You need to implement methods that will eventually handle list and get calls from the re resource. Uh, those are just methods. List of routes. And I'm not sure. Okay, well. Maybe let's go back to, to looking through the code to see if we can find, um, define some some operator extension points. Okay, so here's package again. Um, registry route. We let's look at the scheduler for sure. And then I'm not sure the difference between API and APIs. API with no S. We have endpoints. Persistent volume, pod, service, storage, testing, and V1. What's in V1? Resource, service, et cetera. What's in APIs, the plural? We get ABAC, admission, API discovery, apps, authentication, auto scaling, batch, certificates, coordination, core. Maybe core. The core has things like taint. Toleration. These are, I think, used for scheduling jobs. V1 validation. Uh, some conversion stuff. I don't know. What else is here? I keep coming back to coordination. I feel like let's just try grep. And let's grab for um, operator. Here's quota evaluator persistent volume claims. So the evaluator sounds promising, but that's seem seemingly in the um, in the context only of quota. Use the reference to some sort of operator object. This doesn't seem to be like a general purpose operator. Let's try grep again. Where did my grep thing go? Um, flow control. That's interesting. Labels, tolerations, daemon sets, jobs. Maybe there's more stuff in controller as well. Let's look in controller. Certificates, cron job, deployment, disruption, daemon, endpoint job namespace, pod, pod autoscaler, resource quota, stateful set. I'm not sure. I guess if I can't find anything um, that looks really general, um, we can just look at a couple of specific ones and try to get a, a feel for a feel for how they're different. Here's daemon controller. And we've got some constants like burst replicas. It's a rate limiter for booting pods on a lot of pods. The value of 250 is chosen because values that are too high can cause registry DOS issues. Okay, so you don't want to, make, I guess, create too many pods. 
something about status uh, update retries, the number of retries if sending a status update to the API for its server fails. I guess we'll retry once, probably because we update status so many times. And then here are reasons for daemon set events. And we have things like um, you could uh, you could be selecting everything. Um, there could be some failure event, like you can't schedule a pod, etc. And you maybe you succeeded in scheduling a pod. And we've got the daemon controller, which is a struct, and it's responsible for synchronizing daemon set objects stored in the system with actual running pods. So this is pretty. Um, pretty fundamental to, to, to the scheduling. And we get a cube client. So what does the daemon set controller have? It has a cube client. It's a, an event broadcaster for, I guess, broadcasting events. An event recorder for recording events. A pod control interface. And a CR control, a controller revision control interface, which <laughs> both look pretty... Pretty interesting. Um, these are controller utils. Yeah, I definitely want this. Okay, so I'm gonna keep controller utils open here, I guess on the left. Um, and then some number of burst replicas, uh, a sync handler to allow for injection of, of sync daemon sets for testing. Some more testing stuff. Expectations, which is a TTL cache of pod create deletes. A DS lister, which can list or get daemon sets from the shared informer store. I don't know. We, I don't think we've really seen informer. We've got some listers that can list or get history. Um, we can list pods. Oh no. Um, and we've got a queue which are daemon set keys that need to be synced. A work queue rate limiting interface. So when things need to be synced, I guess we're going to keep them in my queue and maybe they'll be like done all, all at once. And then some failed pod back off. That's from the flow control stuff that we looked at before. And then we can create a new daemon set controller. The stuff we, we passed in, that's basically just a constructor. Um, we can add a daemon set and pass it in a logger and obj interface which is basically a Golang any type, I guess, before they had any types. And we're going to try to cast the obj as a daemon set and log some stuff and then just enqueue the daemon set. Update daemon set is going to take a current and an old and a logger. And if they have different UIDs, then we're going to call key function on the old one. I don't know what key function is. Maybe it gets the key. We might handle some errors. And then we're going to try to enqueue the current. Oh, but first we're going to delete the um, the old daemon set. Yeah, so if they're not, if they're different, we're going to uh, get the key and use the key to delete the old daemon set. And then we're going to um, uh, enqueue the, 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 the current daemon set. And delete daemon set. It's going to take the thing you, you want to delete and also a logger. And uh, we're going to cast the uh, interface, any object into a, an actual daemon set. And we're going to try to call object cache deleted final state unknown and possibly get a tombstone and whether or not I succeeded. And if we didn't succeed, we'll have some error about not get, being able to get it from the tombstone. Otherwise, we're going to try to get um, the daemon set from the tombstone somehow. And uh, if we fail, they will say tombstone contain an object that is not a daemon set. I guess that's just a failure of casting into that type. And then if we're down here, I'm not sure what all this tombstone is doing, all this tombstone stuff is doing. Maybe it's checking if it's already deleted. Delete daemon set. Oh, 
only if we can't, uh, so we, we go into this thing only if um, we can't, I guess, cast the thing that was passed in as a daemon set. So whatever this tombstone is, it's like some sort of error condition because of, because of a casting failure. At any rate, we're just going to get the key and call delete expectations on the key. Delete expectations for the daemon set. So if we create a new one with the same name, it starts clean. So I guess don't expect anything of the old key. Um, but we might create one with a new name. Um, and then DC, uh, DSCQ add key. Is DSC the delete queue? No, Damon said it's controller. Okay, so when you delete the Damon set, it, I guess it deletes the old Damon set. Uh, but why does it add the key to the queue? I'm not sure. Let's find out what we do with this queue ultimately. We've got process wet next work item. Process next work item deals with one key off the queue. It returns false when it's time to quit. So it's going to get something from the queue, like pop off the queue, um, check whether we need to quit, defer uh, like done cleanup stuff from the queue. Um, on the sync handler, maybe sync meaning synchronously, we'll do something. Call call the queue uh, with the key. And we're just going to call the sync handler with the key. There might be an error. We might handle that error. We'll check rate limited stuff and return true. What does sync handler do? Sync handler allows injection of the data set for testing. That's some testing thing. Okay. So where else is the queue used? And why are we adding key here as rather rather than calling in queue date in queuing rather than calling the in queue function? Run, here's run. Run begins watching and syncing daemon sets. We're gonna start some logging or whatever. And then on the cache, we're gonna try to call wage for named cache sync. And if that fails, we'll return. Then we're gonna iterate over the workers. I don't know what the workers are. I guess the workers is some number of workers that's passed in to run. And we're going to call go wait until with context, which I'm not sure what it does. And then we're going to call wait until some stuff happened. I guess maybe until things are done. And then we're going to listen to done. So let's figure out what, what, um, until with context is doing. Uh, this is in back off that go. So that's in the, um, oh, it's in wait. So until with context loops until context is done, running F every period. Until with context is syntactic sugar on top of jitter until with context. So this is just some convenience method for calling the stuff we've already seen. Um, and it's just gonna wait until context is done, essentially which is essentially like waiting for a future to complete, but with a less convenient API, I guess. Um, I'm curious what this cache object is. So tools cache. Can I not go to this file from here? Strike. Uh, Use informer sync. I want to see this informer stuff. Okay, here we are in client go tools cache. And we have this thing called informer sync. It's a function that can be used to determine if an informer has synced. This is useful for determining if caches have synced. So it's an informer. Shared informer. Shared informer provides eventually consistent linkage of its clients to the authoritative state of the given collection of objects. So I guess the authoritative state is probably the Etsy database and eventually consistent means we're going to try to update to what's in the official database. Um, and at any, at any given time, we may not 
be synchronized with the official stuff, but eventually will be will be synchronized in the long run. Um, so that's just standard eventual consistency. An object is identified by its API group, kind, resource, blah, blah, blah. The object metadata UID is not part of the object's ID as far as this contract is concerned. One shared informer provides linkage to objects of a particular API group and kind resource. The linked object collection of a shared informer may be further restricted to one namespace. The authoritative state of an object is what API servers provide access to. Okay, so that should be the essential, essentially what's an etcd. Since the API servers are running on the masters and the masters are really just an interface to the distributed data consensus thingy, an object goes through a strict sequence of states. An object is either one, present with a resource version and other appropriate content, or two, absent. A shared informer maintains a local cache exposed by get store, by, uh, by get indexer in the case of an indexed informer, or possibly by a machinery involved in creating and or accessing the informer. Okay. Um, so I'm going to think of informer as basically just a cache of the stuff that's in etcd, and it's eventually consistent, um, rather than um, whatever the not eventually consistent thing is called. Um, why am I blanking on the name? So strong consistency. Yeah, strong consistency. Okay. So it's not strongly consistent, um, but it's got some, you can add some event handlers. It's got some sync period, or I guess that's when it's going to synchronize. Um, you can run, run starts and stops shared informer. Okay, that's not so interesting. Has sync returns true if the shared informer store has been informed by at least one full list of the authoritative state. Okay. Cool. So that's shared informer. What else do we have in the cache stuff? We've got some sort of index. We've got a heap. We've got a listers and a list watch. And so I wonder if we're just... Um, I wonder if the client is just always synchronizing state. Maybe you have to tell it to watch stuff. Let's see what watch is doing. A lister is, is any object that knows how to perform an initial list. This should return a list type object. Watcher is any object that knows how to start a watch on a resource. It's got a watch function. Watch should begin a watch at the specified version. So I'm guessing that um, the client is going to say what it wants to watch. And um, watch a set of API servers. So instead of getting like the whole Etsy database, the client basically says, I'm going to subscribe to these things. And, um, and then in the background, I guess the client will um, synchronizes its cache with what's on the etcd server. But it seems like we're not, we're maybe not going all the way out to the etcd server for every every request we make. It seems like, at least for some of the stuff, we're um, queuing stuff on the, uh, on the, on the uh, cache thingy, thingamajig. And, uh, I still don't know what's up with this queue. What are we doing with the queue eventually? We can enqueue, we enqueue stuff and dequeue stuff. Maybe I should be looking at the queue type itself. Rate limiting interface. So a rate limiting queue has this rate limiting interface thing, which is an interface that rate limits items being added to the queue. Okay, so you can't add items too quickly, I suppose. So you can add um, rate limited and forget and num requeues returns back how many items, how many times the item was requeued. And then we have the rate limiting queue struct, which has a name, thing for metrics, providing metrics, a clock, and a delaying interface, which I guess allows you to delay things if you're trying to go too quickly. And then 
somewhere there's like a work queue, right? Oh, this is part of the work queue package. Let's see what other things are in work queue. What queue.go? We have a queue config that specifies optional configurations to customize the interface. We can create new queues. Um, type is a work queue. Type is a work queue. Okay, so the um, the type struct has a uh, a queue. Queue defines the order in which the work will be done. A set of a dirty set, um, which is all the items that need to be processed. A processing set, things that are currently being processed. Um, cond maybe like some some sync stuff. I'm not sure exactly what maybe sync condition. Whether it's shutting down, I guess you can a boolean about draining. Maybe whether the, the queue is drained, um, and more metrics. So maybe in the uh, daemon set, let's see if we could find um, if if anything is ever drained or um, processing. Process next work item is called on the queue. No, the, on the daemon set controller. It's just calling something from, from get. Okay. So the, the way that things are pumped from the queue is just we're calling, we're doing one item at a time. I'm not, I don't see any like parallelism or uh, or anything else fancy like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we also shut down the queue in the daemon set. Cool. Let's get rid of that. Let's go to this occur window. Go to cross reference. Let's look at controller utils. So we have this constant thing. We've got expectations timeouts. I don't know how interesting that is. We got something about back off taint, taint back off, and label back off. So labels and taints are, are things you can use to uh, have finer grained control over over Kubernetes objects. We've got a resync period function, maybe for resyncing the cache. And we have expectations. Expectations are a way for controllers to tell the controller manager what they expect. For example, controller expectation. Um, you might say expects two ads in two minutes, expects two deletes in two minutes, etc. Implementation. Controlly expectation is a pair of atomic counters to track controllees creation or deletion. A controller expectation is a TTL store plus a controlly expectation per controller. Once Set expectations can only be lowered. So if you set expectations, you can't, I guess, increase them, but you can lower them. The controller isn't synced till its expectations are either fulfilled or expire. Controllers that don't set expectations will get woken up for every matching, matching control E. All right. So this seems to be a pretty, possibly pretty fundamental. So this is maybe how you're saying what you expect the state to be in some way that, that the Kubernetes code understands. Um, and they're atomic counters. And they just track, um, for the control E expectations, just track creation and deletion. A controller expectation store is a TTL store and each controller is a control E expectation. Okay. We have controller expectations interfaces, an interface that allows users to set and wait on expectations, only abstracted out for testing. These are just setters and getters and whatnot. A controller expectation is a cache mapping controllers to what they expect to see before waking up, woken up for a sync. Okay. 
So th this just basically prevents you from being woken up all the time, I guess. And it's somehow stored in the in a cache. Then we have getters, deleters. Satisfied expectations returns true if the required adds deletes for a given controller have been observed. Add or delete counts are established by the controller at sync time. And update as controllees are observed from the controller manager. Okay. So we're just going to call get, uh, get expectations. And on the expectation, we're going to call fulfilled. And maybe that's just populated if, if the fulfillment criterion is, is met. But let's look at fulfilled to see what it does. The bool is just going to call atomic load in 64 on the expectation. Check whether it's less than or equal to zero. And similarly on the deletions. And that returns, that, that tells you whether it's fulfilled. Okay. I think we're getting closer to, to maybe understanding how some of this stuff works under the hood. This is controller utils. What else is in controller utils? I think that's mainly it. What's down here? You can compute hash. Patch note, you can, I guess, things for dealing with node taints. I could just list the functions here. Um, stuff with working UIDs, working with UIDs, stuff with working with label sets. Patch pods, create pods. Length swap. Um, on lo logging and on active pods. Controllers by creation timestamp. Etc. Okay, so mildly interesting. Here's a TTL controller. I don't know if that's so interesting. Controller ref manager. Let's look at ref manager. We have a base controller ref manager, which has a controller, a selector. It can adopt error. It can adopt once and it can adopt function. We've got this function claim object. Claim object tries to take ownership of an object for this controller. So I guess a controller can try to <laughs> steal something. It will reconcile the following. Adopt orphans if the match function returns true. Release owned objects if the match function returns false. Okay, so I guess if you call on stuff you already own and it returns false, then you uh, release them. Is that what that means? A non-ill error is returned if some form of reconciliation was attempted and failed. Usually controllers should try again later in case reconciliation is still needed. And we won't try to reconcile if the controller is being deleted. So claim object, let's take a look at, at the implementation. Is it long? Pretty long, but not too long. We have a, this function called adopt. The selector matches try to adopt. And adopt is going to take a contact and an object. What else? Get controller of no copy. So I guess we're passing some object, right? We want to see if we can um, control it. So we get the controller. If the if the controller is not nil, I guess it's already being controlled. And if the UIDs of the controller is not the same as our UID, basically self, then we're going to return false. Um, Otherwise, if we are matched, we already own it. The selector matches. That's good. Um, if we're down here, then we uh, own it, but the selector doesn't match, I guess. Owned by, oh, that's what the comment says. Owned by us, but the selector doesn't match. Try to release unless we're being deleted. What is the selector? If match. So it's if match. What does match do? Oh, the match function. We're, we're passing in some function. That's going to tell us whether whether we own it, I guess. And then we'll try to delete to, to release it or whatever. 
What does adopt do? Is that also a function that's passed in? Adopt is also a function that's passed in. So when you try to claim object, you you give it the, the function that you um, you want to use to match, and you also give it the function that will adopt the object. And I guess you also give it the, the function to release it. And those are just passed in. Okay. This is like ownership stuff. Maybe we can find... Um, Just trying to find other occurrences of the the word reconcile. We have the endpoint reconciler. We have controller.go, which is more endpoint reconciler stuff. Control plane reconcilers. The different from reconciler with one. No. We've got some RBAC stuff. Maybe we can look at that. We've got IP allocators, cron jobs, daemon sets, controller, ref manager, which we just looked at. Endpoint slice mirroring, volume stuff. Deployment stuff. Uses control ref manager to reconcile. And then a plugin manager for Kubelet. A CPU manager, volume manager, lots of managers. So it seems like the function we just saw, um, controller ref manager, is pretty general. Let's look at um, occurrences of reconcile here. So claim object is is, is what we just saw. I think this is still claim object. So it's really claim object that's doing the reconciling. So let's look at claim replica sets, I guess. This should be some implementation of claim object. Do we ultimately call claim object? Yeah, here we call claim object. And we're passing in match, adopt, and release, which are here. So match for, for replica sets is, um, we have a replica set controller manager, which has a selector and a matches thingy function um, that's gonna that we're gonna give it some set of labels. So I guess matches will check if to see if it's if it's in the set of labels probably, um, and then adopt replica set. We'll pass it in a context and um, a replica set, and it's just whatever this function is, and then same for release. Let's look at adopt. Adopt replica set sends a patch to take control of the replica set. It returns the error if the patching fails. So we give it the context in the replica set. And we check if we can adopt it. And if we can, then we'll call owner ref controller patch with m.controller, m.controller kind, and the RS UID, the UID of the thing that we're trying to adopt. And then um, this gives us a patch bytes, presumably like we're basically going to patch the YAML file or the corresponding JSON or, or maybe the, the Golang struct. And then if that succeeds, if we succeed in getting a valid patch, then we're going to call patch replica set. So let's look at this owner ref controller patch, which generates the patch. So we've got add controller patch is going to be an object for add owner ref patch, which has some metadata and stuff. And then we're going to marshal into JSON. Yeah. So we're, we're just creating this Golang struct that has the stuff we want to see. We're marshalling it into JSON and returning that as bytes. Okay. So this is beginning to, um, to all make, all make more sense. So controller ref manager seems to be used by other things to implement the controllers. And it's got, um, it's got some like functions you can pass in that, that are the sorts of things that you would implement, I guess, if um, if uh, you wanted to do some of this sort of stuff. Similarly for claim pods, let's look at claim pods just for fun.
adopt pod. We'll look at adopt pod, but presumably that's going to be, um, again, making a struct, marshalling it to JSON. Yeah. So we're essentially just sending it a JSON diff to adopt it. And that's the, that's, that's, that says what our intent is. And then the, um, the ongoing control loops of, of, of the pods are going to like ensure that things are rescheduled. Oh, we still haven't looked at scheduler. So, um, um, but ultimately this is calling claim object. So let's call, let's look at all occurrences of, of claim object. And we don't have a lot. They're all in reference manager. Okay, let's look at occurrences of so what, 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 uh, controller. So a lot of this stuff, like pods, replica sets, um, they're, it seems like their controlly loop stuff is in here, is in this controller ref manager thing, but it doesn't seem like other, uh, other files are using the claim object stuff, at least not directly, presumably claim Claim pods appears elsewhere. Why did it exit abnormally? Yeah, so like stateful set is calling claim pods. Daemon controller is calling claim pods. Job controller is calling claim pods. So we they use this claim stuff indirectly. That's reasonable. And then I, you know, I feel like I have a, an okay sense. Let's take a look at the scheduler, um, and see what we see here. The scheduler. So we have a scheduler struct. The scheduler watches for unscheduled pods. It attempts to find nodes that they spit on and writes bindings back to the API store server. Okay. So we're going to write bindings back. So um, we are going to run some scheduling algorithm, look at how many, you know, look at what resources are free. Um, and then by binding, I assume it means essentially we send some pairing saying that, you know, pod foo is gonna be run on, on node 11 or, or what have you. Okay, so we've got, so in the scheduler, we've got a cache, which is no, not surprising now. We've got an extenders, whatever an extender is. Maybe you can look that up in a, in a few minutes. We've got a queued pod info. Oh, if I hover here, I guess it tells me stuff, right? Um, the extender interface is what? All right, never mind. Forget that. Uh, actually, let's, let's look at it since we almost did. So an extender is an interface for external processes to influence scheduling decisions made by Kubernetes. This is typically needed for resources not directly managed by Kubernetes. Okay, so extender is gonna um, allow some sort of like schedule offloading. If you have um, some non-Kubernetes, some stuff that Kubernetes is not aware of that, that helps to determine whether to schedule your stuff. Um, next, po next pod should be a function that blocks until the next pod is available. We don't use a channel for this because scheduling a pod may take some amount of time and we don't want pods to get stale while they sit in the channel. Hmm. Okay. We have a, hand, a failure handler uh, in case we failed and we need to handle it. We've got a, a, um, a schedule pod function that takes a schedule, that, sorry, that tries to schedule the given pod in one of the nodes on the node list. So we'll pass it a node list, I guess. We'll return a struct of schedule result with the name of suggested host on success. Otherwise, we'll return a fit error with reasons. Okay, so you give it um, a context, a framework, whatever a framework is, a cycle state, and a pod. Let's look up framework and cycle state while we're here. Framework manages the set of plugins 
in use by the scheduling framework. Okay, so I guess you can have different plugins for scheduling. And then what is the state? Is this the state of the scheduler? The cycle state provides a mechanism for plugins to store and retrieve arbitrary data. Really? The state data stored by one plugin can be read, altered, or deleted by another plugin. And it just has a map and some stuff about metrics and stuff for skipping filter plugins. Uh huh. We can stop everything. Close this to shut down the so so we can shut down the scheduler by by having this stop everything channel. Um. Scheduling queue holds pause to be schedules. We we've got profiles which are in some sort of map, I guess. Profiles are the scheduling profiles. I don't know what a profile is. Okay, so um, we can look in that in that that fo the file. It's got a client, I guess, presumably a Kubernetes client. Some info about snapshots. Percentage of nodes to score. I don't know what that means. Index start node index. Then we have options. The percentage of nodes to score is overridden by prior profile level percentage of nodes to score. So we'll look at profile. Um, it's got things like uh, extenders, parallelism, um, and we get for schedule result we have uh, the host that, that I guess we tried to schedule on, number of nodes that we evaluated, number of nodes out of, out of the evaluated ones that fit the pods, but I guess we get the number of nodes but not which nodes, and then nominating info, the nominating info for the schedule cycle. So nominating info may may include things like. Um, where we think it should go. So let's look at nominating info. It's got a node name and a nominating mode. What's a mode? An int. All right. And some with stuff with cube config with parallelism. I guess adding. Oh, okay. These are these are this is a standard um, pattern for options. In Golang, this is kind of, I'm not sure the right way to think about this, but this is like, there's some post about it somewhere. Functional options in Go. I think this is what's going on. I think there's a blog post by one of the Go creators, but it doesn't seem to be one of the top results. Um, so there's more options, more options, a new method for creating a scheduler. And what else? Okay. Let's look at interface. Whoop. Internal. What do we want internal cache? So the internal has a cache, a heap and a queue. So I guess these are the the, the data structures, what's events? Pod add is the event where the new pod is added to the API server. These are just events, I guess, for um, used for scheduling, but they're internal, so you can't depend on them. Look at profile.go. Uh, this should be in, like information about how to schedule stuff. So we have some, um, some map, which is holds frameworks indexed by the scheduler name. A recorder factory for recording events, I guess. You can create a new profile. And that somehow involves a stop channel. We've got a config validator. So we can validate the config. Which I guess we're not going to look closely at. And uh, what, what actually is a profile? Maybe it's an interface. Where is interface? So ultimately we're going to return new framework when we call new profile. Uh, 
I wonder where, um, I guess let's look at framework then. So the framework implementation struct has a, some sort of registry, something about snapshot shared listeners, a list of, uh, I guess, waiting pods, some plugins that before we enqueue stuff for sorting the queue, I guess, pre-filter, filter, post-filter, post -filter, score pull, lots of plugins, pre-bind plugins, basically entry points. We've got a client set, a cube config event recorder. That seems like all client stuff and informer factory, which we saw is the thing that, that I guess synchronizes with the, with that CD. We've got extenders and a parallelizer. Just out of curiosity, I don't know what a parallelizer is. Uh, so I guess we, let's let's chunk um, chunk some units of work and then parallelize them. And then get extension points is basically going to list all the extension points that we saw, all the plugin extension points. Um, we can list the extenders. We've got framework options. and more kind of the functional option stuff. What else? Here's a framework interface. I think this was the file I was looking for a couple of minutes ago. So we've got this node score thing. I still don't know what, um, what it means to score a node, or, or rather, I assume that it scores like fit. The node score has a uh, name, I presumably have the node and a score, which is a 64 in 64. We've got some map from nodes to statuses. Uh, plugin score is a struct with node name and scores for that node. And whatever a plugin score is. Some constants like success code, unschedulable, unschedulable and unresolvable, wait. And we've got this list of codes like success, I guess, human readable versions of these constants. The maximum score, I guess, so, so plugins are gonna score things. So I guess we'll offload scoring to, to plugins potentially. The maximum score you can give is 100, the minimum score is zero. And maybe that's kind of like a percent. Um, Okay, and we've got some status struct, which will have a code and reasons. This kind of looks like a gRPC status. And maybe everything is happening in the, in the plugins, and that's why this is called interface. We have a waiting pod. Waiting pod represents a pod currently waited, currently waiting in the permit phase. And we've got things like allow and reject. Whoops. Okay. And then more, more like entry points for, for plugins. Let's see if, if, are there any default plugins? Maybe here's plugins, examples, features, image, locality, names, no affinity. Okay. Here. So, okay. So things like affinity are going to influence scheduling. That would make sense. Um, scheduling gates, testing. Let's look at examples. I don't know which ones are most interesting. Prebind. Prebind is the functions invoked by the framework at prebind extensions point. So this is some, I, I guess, um, not callback, but like a function that you implement that's going to be called at some point in the cycle, the scheduling cycle. And we'll check if the pod is nil, and in which case we'll error out saying that it can't be nil. And if the pod is not in the foo namespace, we're going to say we, we're going to error out because we can only schedule pods in the foo namespace. Otherwise, we return nil, which I guess means um, we can schedule. And then what else? That's it. I guess this, this schedule thing just blocks, blocks things that are uh, not in the foo namespace. All right. How about stateful? So multi-point example is an example of a plugin that's executed at multiple extension points. This plugin is stateful. 
receives arguments at initialization and changes its state when executed. Okay. So reserve, reserve is the function invoked. Okay, so reserve is an extension point function. We're gonna pass it in some stuff, including cycle state, and we're just gonna um, append something, append the word reserve to the execution points. So that's, we're just gonna say that we were called by reserve, I guess. Um, Pre-bind, we're gonna get a lock, defer unlock, append the pre-bind execution point, and check if it's nil, and really nothing else. Okay, so those are just examples of like how to use the code, I guess. Let's look at node affinity. So node affinity is a plugin that checks if a node pod node selector matches the node label. This should be mildly interesting. Um, so pre we have a pre-score state key. Uh huh. So let's see what you do with store. With score, I mean. Here's the score function. Here we go. Score returns the sum of the weights of the terms that match the node. These terms come from the pod, spec affinity, node affinity, and from the plugins default affinity. The score is going to take a context, a cycle state, the pod, and a node name. And we're going to, I guess, score whether the pod should go in this node. And we're going to get node info from the snapshot shared lister. Basically, use our snapshot of the nodes of whatever we, whatever snapshot we have of the node, I suppose, by looking it up by name. Um, check some status. Get the node from the node info object. Create the variable count. Um, if pl add pref sketch terms is non nil. What is pl? Oh, node affinity. So we're gonna look up some. Um, some item in preferred scheduling terms, whatever that is. Um, so we're going to look up whatever this thing is and possibly increment account by it. And then we're going to get pre-scored state and set it as S and check error handling. And if S preferred node affinity is not nil, then we're going to, we're going to um, add the S preferred node affinity score of node to the count. We're going to return count. So S is pre-score state. And we're looking at the pre-score preferred node affinity um, and possibly adding it to the count. So what does this do? So count starts at zero here. Let's, and we possibly um, added to it with whatever PL added pref sched terms is. Right, but I don't see where we like checked um, the label. Score returns the sum of the weights of the terms that match the node. Terms that match the node. Terms came from the pod, spec affinity, node affinity, and from the plugins default affinity. So we get some stuff from the from the pod affinity, and I guess we're comparing it to the node affinity. Is that what we're doing? So here's the node affinity stuff, right? And here's the pod affinity stuff. But I'm not really sure. We seem just adding stuff to count. Here's a comparison against nil. Oops. I thought we were supposed to like take a, a label, the pod selector. So wherever score stuff is, I, I, um, I don't see where, where label stuff is happening, but presumably it's somewhere. Do 
Here's pre-filter. Pre-filter builds and writes cycle state used by filter. We're getting the affinity from pod spec affinity. No node affinity. Um, is checking whether node affinity is nil or whether um, whatever required required during scheduling ignoring ignored during execution is nil. And that's no node affinity. If we have no node affinity and um, add added node selector is nil and the pod spec node selector is nil, then the node affinity filter has nothing to do with the pod. And we basically tell that we have nothing to do by returning nil uh, with a status saying to skip it. Otherwise we're down here and we get some sort of whatever the pre-filter state is. And we write the pre-filter state key with the state, I guess, to the database. And then we check the node affinity and I guess check some um, error, errory stuff. Oops. And uh, possibly return nil if stuff, um, if we don't need to do more processing. And then if we're down here, we need to, we, we are checking if there's an affinity to a specific node and return it. Okay. Then we get terms and node names and we iterate over um, the terms. And we get term node names, some set of names, um, and we match, try to match fields with it. And then if node names are not nil, but length is zero, it means each term have conflicting affinity to node name. Therefore, pod will not match any node. So if this happens, um, we return uh, like a unschedulable and unresolvable and a reason conflict. Um, otherwise, we return nil nil. So I guess this is the this is the function that that or stuff like this is we've already filtered out stuff that that doesn't match our affinity and that's why I wasn't seeing it in score, which makes sense. So I think I'm basically going to leave this here. Um, let me see. Is there anything in cluster that looks especially interesting? Volume, windows, capabilities. I don't know what capabilities is. Privileged, host PID sources. Um, there's stuff like service. Maybe we should look, take a quick look at, at, at service, then call it a day. This doesn't seem like the the real service. Maybe under V1, V1 service, package service. Maybe the API. Okay, so V1, uh, API core V1. Okay. Uh, API core V1. Okay. Maybe? No. Where are we? Types. Okay. API core v1 slash types. Um, are we in the same repo? We're in staging. Is staging uh okay? Controller manager. So, so 
I didn't really look into the staging thing. Um, I think this seems like it might be um, a bunch of the a bunch of the interfaces. So you guys like health checkable stuff. Controller manager. What else do we have? App. Controller context. Serve with an E. Controller context defines the context object for the controller. We got client builder, informer factory, informer started, recent period. So we're not really seeing anything that looks um, that looks fundamentally new in controller. It's in package. We have things like health Z, features, informer factory, leader migration. Let's look at leader migration. Migrator. Leader migration, leader migrator holds information required by the leader migration process. We've got a migration ready, which is a channel, I guess, is closed after the controller manager finishes preparing for the migration lock. After this point, the leader migration process will proceed to acquire the migration lock. We can get a new leader migrator object. And that's it. Do we have other structs? Okay, so there's not here, not much here. New leader migrator. You turn controller migrated. What is this? This is in um, package slash leader migration. We just have some enum. So it doesn't look like a, a ton of stuff here. What is util going to do? It just has something about whether it's enabled. Okay. So um, let's get out of controller manager. Is there anything else here? Component base, cli, config, feature gate. Maybe nothing so so interesting. Um, KMS, kubectl, kubelet, mount utils. Um, but I think what we really came for was API and core and i just wanted to take take a quick look at service which is maybe in here service no i had it open before i was in types Types that go. Okay, so here's a service. Um, the service is a named abstraction of software service, for example, MySQL, consisting of local port, oops, consisting of local port, for example, 3306, that the proxy listens on, and the selector that determines which pods will enter requests sent through the, pa through the proxy. Very cool. Um, all right. And um, here's a struct. We've got type, I guess, meta, metadata, um, object metadata, a service spec, which is a spec, which is like the YAML thing, and then a status, which is a server status. Most recently observed, observed status of the service. So this is just an insight into how like some of the YAML stuff is 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 coded. The service status has a load balancer, the current status of the load balancer if one is present, and some conditions. And whatever I guess uh, condition metadata. Condition contains details for one aspect of the current state of the API resource. The struct is intended for direct use as an array at the field path. Dot status dot conditions. And the condition has things like a status, observed generation, uh, I guess last transition time, uh, reason. Reason contains a programmatic identifier indicating the reason for the condition's last transition, and um, a message. And so these are the sorts of things that you will see if you ask for, you know, if you call get service, you, um, uh, or maybe describe, look at a bunch of this sort of information. So that's um I'll stop there. There's a whole lot more we could go into, but I think we have a I think we've gotten a sense of um 
how how things are working. We saw kind of the bootstrapping um, control process. We saw how um, there's this, there's this kind of like local cache for clients, and it's synchronizing with the um, the etcd service. And uh, we saw some of the 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 insertion points where if you're trying to control um, your own object, we saw sort of how um, the internal controls worked for things like pods um, and uh, and we also saw things like uh, so things that were, were built on those more internal control versions, um, things like daemon sets or jobs or, or I think replica sets. And then we saw some of the entry points for for the scheduler. Um, and finally, the last thing we looked at is is sort of the layer that builds the the user visible Kubernetes API on top of what's underneath. So um, that's it for now. We may at some point take a deeper or, or like another iteration of, of the look at Kubernetes, possibly fo focusing either on a, a higher up layer or some other aspect of the um, of the internals that we didn't quite get to. Um, but that's all for me. Thanks for watching.